your Bibles with me this morning, please, and turn to John, the Gospel according to John. I'm going to start a series in John. I was praying about what the Lord, I know I wanted to start a new series and was praying that the Lord would just help me decide which one to do and thought, you know, what better to do than to look and study and know and love and, and come to memorize the the words of our Lord, the words of Jesus. So looking at the Gospel of John, we started in Sunday school. I handed out outlines and everything. And um, so I did an introduction in Sunday school to John. But today we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at the Word of God. The Word of God. Let's, if you found your place, John chapter 1. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Father, we do ask and pray, Father, that you would just bless your word, that you will penetrate our hearts, our minds, our understandings, that you will do your great work. Father, we may see the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ. We may worship him. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This opening sentence is one of the most profound statements there is in all of the universe but yet simple enough that a child can understand. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternal, infinite God creator says that he became a person in the Lord Jesus Christ and dwelt among us. The deity of Jesus Christ Jesus of Nazareth, being God, is an essential and non-negotiable fact of the Christian faith. Amen. And you've got to understand that. Uh, for all of Christianity, you must submit and acknowledge the reality of Jesus is God. Jesus is the God-man. Uh, the Bible uh, it conclusively proves this. Well, first, we see directly from Scripture. In the Old Testament, when Moses uh, went to the burning bush and, and Moses said, God, I know you're sending me, but who shall I say sent me? And God spoke out of the bush in Exodus 3, 14. And he says that he said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am have sent you. But John, as we read the life of Jesus, Jesus repeatedly tells us that he is the I am. Jesus says, I'm God. And that is repeatedly. He says in uh, John chapter 8, verse 58, turn there with me quickly. John 8, 58. So actually start back up. Um, verse 52. John 8, 52. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet, Ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Well, that's a big statement Jesus is making. Abraham saw Jesus' day. Verse 37, then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. 
Jesus says that he is the I am. And that I am in the Greek, it's emphatic. It's hego hemi. It means I, I am. And so he is the I am. And notice that Jesus had put himself equal with God. In chapter 8, verse, flip back for a minute. Look at verse 8, 23. Jesus makes this statement. Chapter 8, verse 23. Some of these uh, scriptures we already went over in Sunday school, but they're very important for us to, to get the thrust of the message. Verse 23, at chapter 8, verse 23. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins... For if ye believe not that I am, and that word he was added. That was added by the translators. What is Jesus saying? If you do not believe that I am, the I am, ye shall die in your sins. Amen. It is non-negotiable. It is of utmost importance that we see Jesus, the Christ, the Son of Man, the man who was born, who dwelt among us. He had friends as he walked. He had disciples. He, had, he was a man, just as we are man. He was all man, but all God. But yet he says that I am not from beneath. You are. He said he's from above. And if you do not believe that Jesus is God, indeed God, you shall die in your sins. That's what he says. And then it goes on. Paul states in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, he says that Jesus existed in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a serf, servant. All right, secondly, Jesus has the titles that belong only to God. Jesus says the title we just saw. He says, I, the I am. Uh, we see in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Jesus is, and God are both referred to as the holy one, the just. First and the last, light, Lord of the Sabbath, Savior, pierced one, mighty God, Lord of lords, Lord of glory and the Redeemer. Both, all of those titles belong to both. Third, Jesus does the works that only God can do. Look at John chapter 1. Come back with me to John chapter 1. What did Jesus do? In verse 3, all things were made by him. Jesus created. Only God can create. Only God can do that, that kind of work. Jesus is God. He created all things. And in Colossians 1.16, it says, All things were made for him and by him, and all things consist. He sustains all things. Jesus raises the dead. Only God can do that. Jesus forgives sin. Only God can do that. Jesus, his word is eternal. And only God's words are eternal. And fourth, Jesus received worship. There is nowhere in the Bible anything that God has created is to be worshipped. Only God is to be worshipped. And God will not share his glory with another. But Jesus is worshipped. And Jesus does not correct them. The angels will correct men for worshipping them. Man will correct other men, or they should, <laughs> for worshipping them. Now, again, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the thing that we see immediately with John. John goes immediately into the deity and the lordship of Jesus Christ in his pre-existence. Before Jesus was ever born, Jesus was God. Jesus did not come into existence. Jesus has always existed, and he's always existed as God. So this is what the Bible teaches us. In verse 1 through 18, there's a prologue where John is establishing this before he gets into the ministry work of Jesus. Uh, verses 1 through 3 teach us that Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal eternal with God the Father. In verse 4 through 5, uh, it teaches us that the salvation which Jesus brought. Verses 6 through 8, the salvation was announced by Jesus' herald, John the Baptist. He heralded that the Savior is coming. And then verses 9 through 13, 
It describes the reception which Jesus received. It says that he came into his own and his own received him not. But look at verse 11. Jesus came into his own, the very God-man, and his own received him not. But look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That wasn't just then, that's now, today. Many reject Jesus Christ. He has come and many reject him. But thank the Lord, as many as receive him, to them he gives power to be the sons of God. So let's look at this together quickly. And there, there's going to be a few things that I want to draw out of these five verses. I'm not sure if we'll get through all five of them. But as we begin, chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning God was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, there's another book that starts the exact same way. It's called Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This here is the beginning. This means the beginning of everything. Not just the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but this is God in his pre-existence as God before anything was made or created. Uh, I like the old preacher. There's, I, I want to find him, and I know this quote, but there, there's this old preacher that said, uh, in the beginning there was nothing. And God, at one point, looked out at nothing and decided to create something. And then in nothing, God created this something and hung it on nothing and told it to stay there. And all of these things, God looked out at the something that he did from nothing and the something that is in nothing, and he said, it is good. God is the creator. God is the creator, the sustainer. In the beginning was the word. Now, who's the Word? Well, let's look at verse 14. We're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to find out who the Word is. And the Word was made flesh. Only Jesus did that. And he dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he, this is saying in the beginning, before there was anything, was Jesus. And the Jesus, the Word, was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Not only was he with God, he is God. The same was in the beginning with God, verse 2, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And so we see this Word come out. In the beginning was the Word. Now, uh, John, I love more than anything... Uh, I know many of you know John, uh, the Apostle John, which is one of Jesus' 12 apostles, the disciple. He, he wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wrote Revelation. Uh, we know John. One of the thing about John was John was in love with Jesus. John loved Jesus. And, I mean, it, John didn't even refer to himself as John. Uh, the only reason we know that John wrote this was because it is the disciple whom Jesus loveth. And it's the fact that he mentions everybody else except John, that we know it's John, that wrote this. Whenever you see John, he's talking about John the Baptist in the book of John. He loved the Lord, and he really comes across this whole dependency upon him. Uh, like we said in Sunday school, the, word, the, the purpose of the word of John was that thou may believe. I have written these things that thou may believest on the Son of God and that you should have life. Uh, it's one of the few books the author gives us his purpose straight up is that I've written these things that ye might believe. The word believe in the book of John is used a hundred times, twice more than any other of the Gospels. And so the thrust is that John had eyewitness. Here is the Son of God. Here's the Messiah. Here is God in flesh. He dwelt among us. We handled him. He calls him the Word of life. He calls Jesus the Word because if you think about the Word when it comes to the Greek and the Logos, what is, what is a Word? It's an expression. 
How do you communicate? How do you communicate your identity? How do you communicate who you are? Through your words, right? Jesus is the word. He's the express word of God. And so Jesus is the expression. He came and partook of our flesh, and he became Emmanuel, which is God with us. What you're holding in your hands right now is the Word of God. We call this the Word of God. But the expression of God in this Bible is through words. He expresses himself through words. When Jesus came, he expressed himself through a man. That's the man, Christ Jesus, and only Jesus. And he came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to save those who were cast down, brokenhearted, who just been run over, over and over again by this life. And just sins, wrapped them up. He came to them. He comes to you. And he will save you. But it says... Back to the Word. Now we're going to look at the Word, Word, a couple different times. That words that Jesus has expressed His image. We don't have maybe have time to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. I invite you to Wednesday. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that the Word, that Jesus is God's final Word. That He is the express image of God in His person that he is the brightness of his glory. Jesus is God's final word. God cannot say any more than he's already said through Jesus Christ. So he's done talking. God's done giving us new revelation. He gives it all through Jesus Christ. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. He instructs all the world, all the universe, Hear him. This is my final word. Jesus is God's final word. And we know in the past that God had spoken in different ways and different, through different types of men, but in these last days have spoken unto us by his Son. Uh, in Matthew 17, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and there was a voice that came out of heaven, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. There's so many competing voices out there today. But God tells you to hear his son. All these competing voices are, want your attention. They want your buy-in. They want you to get on board with their truth. Everybody's got their truth nowadays, don't they? There's no relative truth. There's no absolute truth. Aren't you glad your pharmacist doesn't think that way? Aren't you glad your pharmacist doesn't say, well, that's not my truth. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make the medicine the way I, I think the medicine should be made. Aren't you glad that there's absolute truth? That there's absolute standards? And did you know that God had created us with absolute values? And that those values are in the image of God? That God had created man in his image? Now, we've squandered a lot of that image away when Adam and Eve fell and we sinned against God and we've disobeyed God. But there is a truth. And God says, hear Jesus for this truth. Hear him alone. Not all the other voices that are out there. Uh, they're competing for your attention. They're, they're competing for your buy-in. These voices are, are competing for your compassion and and and. Your, me, your way of life and, and everything, and you're not looking uh, just like uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes. How many of you all are living underneath the sun and you're not living above the sun? That Solomon said everything under the sun is vanity. It's all vanity. I mean, we're here for a little time and then we vanish away. And what, what was it? What worth was it? What is it? Well, all that, all that passion you threw into this movement or this movement, you know that everything is the same as it always has been and always will be. And you got all these people scampering about thinking life is this, life is this, all under the sun. And, he, and Solomon says it's all vanity. How, it's not long before you're forgotten. The generation may remember you. 
There may be some things, you know, one of the hardest things I had to do, and many, many can attest, is when we had to start deciding what to throw away of mom and dad's when they passed. I was like, you know, these diplomas and these degrees, I remember as a child going into dad's study, and I'm like, wow, dad's got, you know, this and this. Look at all these degrees. Look at all these diplomas. They're, they're awesome. And then I had them in my hands. It didn't feel like any time had gone by just like that. I had them in my hands deciding whether to put them in the trash. They were of no value. And then here pretty soon, um, he will be forgotten. Solomon says it's all vanity and vexation of spirit. It's chasing the wind. But there is truth. When you step back and you see the big, bigger picture that God has created the heaven and the earth, man has fallen from his original state in fellowship with God. He has fallen from the original design of God. The original design of God when he created man and woman was to bring glory to God and to enjoy him and to be thankful. But they disobeyed. They fell. Uh, Satan had tempted Eve and saying, you know what, God is not, he, he tells you not to do this, but he, he knows that you'll be happier if you do this. Don't you want your will instead of God's? That was Satan's main temptation to Eve. If you come and you stop and think about it, bottom line, Eve, do you really want God's will or do you want your will? That is what it came down to. Do you really want to subject yourself to God or do you want to do what you want to do? That was Satan's whole thing right there. He throws it at us all the time. They disobeyed God. They lost fellowship with God. But oh, oh, the word of God that God's expressed here tells me of a Jesus. Tells me of a Messiah. That he, God knew that there'd be no reconciling man unless God himself had stepped in in grace and love. He could have just let us all go. He could have just blew us all away and started all over. But he didn't. He sent his son. He knew his son would be worshipped forever and ever and ever by his creation because his son will save us from our sins and destruction. That's the big picture. That's the above the sun. That's what's going on. It's going to catch a whole lot of people off guard. A whole lot of people are going to be like, you know what? I thought this was all there was. Something I'm trying to do is, is stop drinking so much Diet Mountain Dew. I'm like, because one of the things that convicted me was the empty cases of Diet Mountain Dew. I was like, there's no way I drank this much. I said, like, Jason, you've got to stop drinking so much Diet Mountain Dew. Because I'd walk by and I'm like, there's no way, all these cases. The evidence was condemning me of the Diet Mountain Dew. So I'm like, you know what, I'm going to start drinking tea, I'm going to start drinking water, I'm going to start doing this. But you know, every time that I picked up a Diet Mountain Dew, at no point in my mind I thought that this was something I need to stop. Or I thought that this was getting to be too much. It wasn't until I was confronted with the evidence that it had been too much. I started seeing the effect around me. I started seeing the effect on my health. When I'm, there was nothing greater than popping that diamond, dude, studying, doing something, because it's great, I love it, I love the taste. But then I got, you know, how many people right now, they feel like this is it. This is their best life now. This is everything they're doing, is they're contributing to society, they're contributing to this better way, this better thing. And um, I'm gonna, I know, I know, I'm, 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 I'm on my soapbox, and I, I really, the Lord had put this on my heart so much. I don't usually do this, but did y'all watch the Republican uh, primary, the debates? Did y'all watch it at all? I watched the fourth and final one. I was like, well, let me just turn over there and just see what's going on. We know that Trump's the front runner, so who are these other, other guys? And the issues that they were discussing, I was floored. They were discussing issues rather than make it legal that children 
can have transgender surgeries without their parents' permissions. And I almost, I was in shock. This is an issue. This is something that actually is being talked about. And I almost wanted to turn it off and start crying. Lord, what is going on? I mean, you have to be 18 years old to have a tattoo. But you can be a child and have transgender surgery. There are many of these states that are doing it. These things are irreversible. And I was like, Lord, America is making Sodom and Gomorrah look like a daycare. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's what's going on. It's rebellion against God. Call it what you want. Call it self-expressionism. Call it world peace. Call it love. It's rebellion against God. Think about God. Think about your Creator. Now, think about what is the best way to rebel against God. Let's write down some things. How can I really show that I'm going to cast God away from my life? He doesn't get to tell me what to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. And not only that, I'm going to be so defiant. I'm going to go against what He's designed me to do. I'm going to be somebody else. I want to do somebody else. Have you seen the, the identify as animals stuff coming out? The flurries, is, is that what it is? Every time I say that, Jason bows his head and shakes his head. He goes, my generation, Dad. My generation. The flurries and all these other things. And how long is it? It's ridiculous to us right now. But 50 years ago, that topic I listened to was ridiculous. It won't be long before there's going to be operations turning people into animals. That's funny, isn't it? No. You, you mark my words. It's ridiculous to us now. How can we cast God off? Totally tell God, we don't want you. We do exactly what we're seeing in our nation, in our society. But God has come to save. Here's my thing. There's many broken God saves the broken. I am so compassionate. Brother Philip, you mean that you wouldn't have somebody transgender come in and sit down in, in, in the church? I would absolutely have every single person who's transgender, any of those things. You are more than welcome. You come and sit down in our church and we're going to love you. We're going to show you the love of Christ. We're going to show you that Jesus has come to seek and to save those who are lost and left into your own self. The Bible says is that if we do not believe Him, the wrath of God will abide upon you. That means me too. That means all of these uh, self-righteous judgmental people who uh, unfortunately are going around and that's your perception of Christianity. Let, let me tell you something. A true Christian knows, knows they're not better than you. That's a true Christian. A true Christian knows that they're a sinner saved by grace. And if it were not for the grace of God. And here's the thing is I'm just a beggar who's trying to tell other beggars where to find bread. I'm nobody. God has come and saved me and gave me a life. And yes, you come and we will love you and we will share the gospel with you. But I will say this right now. If you profess Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you sympathize, with any of that, you better check again with your God because it's sin. It's sin. You call it what it is. You know what Jesus said? If you are ashamed of Jesus in this perverse and crooked generation, and that was in his generation, that's in every generation. If you are ashamed of him, that means that if you want the world's acceptance because of what you say more than Jesus' acceptance, if that's the acceptance you want, Jesus says he's going to be ashamed of you before his Father in glory. You're not thinking big picture. 
you're not thinking in eternity. Amen. You're not thinking of how I can show the love of Christ, but at the same time, you've sinned against God. You've sinned. You need to come and you need to own it before Him. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that is the difference between some people that get up and do hate speech. All of this is in love. Escape for your life. That's what Lot, he told them, the fire is coming. God's wrath is coming. Whether you're this degree worse than the next person, the fire is going to get you both. It doesn't matter that you are the repent of your sins before an all holy God. One little sin is poison. You could have just stole a candy bar when you were 12 years old, and that's been your only crime. That's sin against God, and that'll have to be paid for. But Jesus paid for it. Jesus paid for it. Oh, it calls Jesus the eternal word, the last word, the incarnate word. And he calls him the word of life. Jesus is the word of life. In him was life. The Bible gives us the expression of God in words. Jesus was the expression of God himself in his person. He came as he was prophesied. You know, when we were looking and he says, I am. And he says that Abraham saw my day and rejoiced in it. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus. 2,000 years. Micah and Isaiah had given prophecy 700 years before Jesus was ever born. Jesus had, had stepped into our world history right when he was supposed to. And there, the Bible tells us that Jesus, the incarnate flesh, he partook of our flesh. And that he became a man. And he became obedient unto death. In Hebrews, we're talking about how Jesus has become our perfect, merciful, and faithful high priest because of his sufferings unto death. That he tasted death for us. That he tasted death. He tasted the grief, the sorrow of this life. You know, one of the beautiful things. Oh, I can't believe I almost didn't say this. I was telling this to April the other day. And look it up for yourself. There is something, and maybe you all have seen it. On I kind of look at Instagram reels and things. And some of the things that are on there are pretty neat. But... Somebody had said, you know what? I don't understand why the birds are singing two, an hour before it becomes daylight. It's, it's not even daylight yet, and it's, it's dark, and the birds are singing. Well, come to find out, the birds have a frequency. And that frequency of song, it opens, it, enables, it engages with the flowers, and the flowers start opening up. The flowers know that it's time to start opening, and so by the time the sun is over top of them, they are receiving the full nourishment. There's something called a God frequency. Did you all know that? Uh, look it up on Spotify. If, if, if you have Spotify or just look, go home and Google it. About how the frequency of the birds. And I promise you, I think maybe that could add to December's kind of gloom. and do Because there's no birds singing. I believe that God has given them a frequency of song that opens them up. And you know, I got to thinking about that. How God, how the, God had given the birds a frequency when they speak, the flowers open up. Think about this. One day, one day Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. He died. He was buried. And then he rose again. He ascended. He is alive today. One day he is returning. That's who it's talking about. He's not returning as a babe in a manger. He's not returning as a suffering servant. He's returning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's going to pitch out his frequency. And he's going to say, come forth. Just as Jesus rose from the tomb, we see resurrection morning before the day had broke. Oh, isn't that beautiful? The day, it was still dark. But Jesus rose up. And one day he's coming back and he's going to say, Philip, come forth and I'm going to hear his frequency. You better believe I'm going to hear it. I'm going to come up. I'm going to come up out of the grave and I'm going to be with him forevermore. That's big picture. That's big picture. That's my God. My God knew that I, I had a problem. 
a sin problem. You have a sin problem. And he, this whole story, John says, I bear witness of this man, how he was full of grace and truth. And these things that I write unto you, the things that I witness, that God has preserved in his word, this writing of John is 2,000 years old. 2,000 years old. And that's young compared to some of the other writings. John says, if you believe, in his name, you will have life. You'll have it today. You'll have it right where you sit, just as you are. There's no, nothing you have to do. You just have to believe upon his name. He will save you. He'll give you eternal life. That's the record which John bore. That's the record he's giving to us. And he first states, and I'm, I am excited about going through John, but today is the day if you hear his voice, turn not away. Today is the day. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the day. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and goodness to us. Father, your love and grace to us, Lord, we'll never be able to fully comprehend. But, Father, you make the message so simple to us. All of us have fallen short. And we need to see that within ourselves, that we've sinned against you as only you. Father, we know the law and the Ten Commandments could never save us. They actually condemn us. They show us where we've gone wrong. The law is a whistleblower. But you, Father, faith in you, that's all you've asked for, is to have full faith in Jesus Christ who died and paid the sin debt, rose again the third day, and he's coming again. As sure as we stand here, he's coming. Father, what a day that'll be. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each heart, be with each need. Lord, we pray for your will to be done, and we will bring you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.